Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Today, the 3rd of February, we're having Ron Mayfield from Pearl Land, Tex Texas, work some saltwater magic with us. The weekly tip is going to be about some changes to the Macos cameras. No fly tying tips, just better ways to demonstrate fly tying on Zoom. We're the Beaties from Boise, Idaho. Ron Mayfield uh, from Pearl Land, Texas, has been fishing since he was four years old and fly fishing and fly tying since he was 13. That's more than 50 years. Growing up in the Texas Gulf Coast, Ron specializes in tying warm water and saltwater fly patterns and is known for his innovative deer hair patterns such as the lily pad jumping frog, the, mo hair, the mohawk minnow pinfish featured in Fly Tire magazine, and the Umpqua rattle mullet. Ron is currently the director of fly tying for the FFI Texas Council. He's a Umpqua fly designer and an FFI casting instructor. Tonight, he's presenting two of his saltwater patterns, the jerk me bend back and the bonefish bites. And Ron, the bonefish bites sounds really interesting. The stage is all yours. Go for it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for showing up tonight. This was kind of last minute. So appreciate it. So I'm going to be tying two flies today. We're going to start off with a fairly simple one, which is the bonefish bites. This is a pattern I've been working on for several years. And the biggest bonefish I've caught in Belize, Yucatan, and Andros, Bahamas, was on the bonefish bites fly. So we've all seen all sorts of variations of gotchas and crazy charlies and a lot of different patterns out there. This one has, I think, one thing that might be a little bit unique, and it's how I created the shell. Most of the gotchas and crazy charlies, they really don't mimic the shell of the shrimp. So I found a way to do that that's pretty simple, and it, it's been very effective. I was in Chetamal Bay on the Yucatan the last September. We had six guys fishing for five days. We caught seven tarpon up to 100 pounds. We caught, I think, between 50 and 55 bonefish. Half of the bonefish were caught on this fly pattern. I caught 23 myself on this pattern in five days. And then the biggest bonefish I caught it when I was in Andros in December was on this fly also. So it's been very productive, but it took me a while to get, get to it. So we'll go ahead and get started on how you tie it. Okay, we're going to start with an 811S. A four or six, this is a six. I'm going to go ahead and use a little bit larger hook, easier to see. We're going to start off by putting barbell eyes. I'm going to take it just off the eye a little bit. Now you see what I'm doing right now with my thread? I'm going over the barbell. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, so I've, you can probably hopefully kind of see this if I turn a little bit. See, I've got quite a bit of thread that comes out away from the barbell. By doing that pattern from going over and over, I can then now re go like a regular figure eight and clamp down on that thread and it it puts a lot of pressure, ah, so much so that I break my thread sometimes. I'm going to work my thread to the back of the hook, going past the bend a little bit. Ah. How many people have heard of a spawning shrimp? You hear that there's several patterns out there that do a spawning shrimp. But that kind of confuses me because they put something near the front of the hook. And shrimp, when they spawn and they keep their eggs, they keep them in the legs, in the back, not in the front. So I think this putting some color, especially like an orange color, 
near the front is really mimicking the gut of the shrimp. So I've taken close up pictures and depending upon what the shrimp eat, their stomach is, because the way we're gonna tie this is, this is gonna be the front. And in the front right here, a lot of times their stomachs and their digesting will be orange. And I'm gonna put a little spot right here. But when I get right to the bend, I'm going to make uh, I'm going to make it pretty thick because I'm going to use that thickness there to splay the eyes that I'm going to put on next. So I got my spawning shrimp or maybe digesting shrimp. Next, I'm going to get my eyes going. And I've already built my eyes. They're 30 pound monofilament. And you make a V in the monofilament. Then with a Bic lighter, you burn them. I, I build them this way so that they're pointing down. So when I, I melt them, the eyes go down. Then I'm going to use those eyes and put them right like that and use that yarn to splay them out. Now, you want to make your eyes a little bit long. If you try and tie it in right where the bend is, it's very difficult to do. So I tie it in a little behind the bend. I guess I should say in front of the bend, get it going, put the other one in, and then I can control it. And I get the eyes spread apart the way I want it. And of course, when you turn up, see how they're going to be pointing up a shrimp to see around, to look at predators coming on, they, they put their eyes up very high on little stalks. They go up very high. So I want to be able to mimic that. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is put in the legs. So I'm going to get some tan with a little bit of sparkle silly legs. And I'm going to put them right where I tied in the eyes. So when I tied in the eyes, I made kind of a little flat spot. It makes it really easy to get your eyes or get your legs in. Okay, got my legs going. Then we're gonna start on the body. And for the body, I like to use something that's a little flashy, but not too flashy. So I use uh, McFly on. Let's see. Let's see. I don't know. Can y'all see that? Too much glare, McFly on. I love this stuff. Easy to work with, and it's easy to control. Tie it in, take it right up to the legs and then work the thread back a little bit. I'm gonna make two turns. And then tie it off. That comes the Arctic Fox. I really like Arctic Fox. It adds a lot of motion. So the, the legs, the front legs on a shrimp, they move them around a lot. They're feeding. And so there's, there's some motion there. And this Arctic fox, if there's any water movement at all, it'll give you, give you some motion. I'm going to take out the guard hairs. See, that's not a whole lot, just a little bit. Measure it where I want to put it and finish trimming it down. I'm going to get my Arctic Fox in there.
Make sure I got it on straight. Okay, then I'm going to work my thread in front of the fly on. Then I'm going to do another couple wraps of the McFly on, tie it off. And a lot of people put a lot of sparkle on their flies, their, their bonefish flies. I don't like a whole lot of sparkle. I don't think it's real natural, but um, I like this EP compound. It's like a micro flashaboo, but what's important, it's UV. I really like the UV. I think it, and I think you can see it in this light. It gives off a little purplish sheen. That's the iridescence, very similar to the iridescence we find on shrimp, a lot of shrimp species. So I'm gonna grab a bit of this, not a whole lot. I'm gonna tie it in next. So not a whole lot of it. And then like most synthetics, you tie it in the middle, then you fold it over and that way it's not gonna pull out. Synthetics are so smooth. So got a little bit of flash in there. Then move the thread in front of the McFly on again, move it forward, make a couple more wraps right up to the barbell eyes and then tie it off again. This time I'm going to trim the fly on. We're done with it, my fly on. Then I take super hair. This we used to call it super hair. Uncle used to call it super hair. I think some people call it silly hair. And this is my shell. And this is what makes this fly different than a lot of other flies out there. And I don't use a whole lot, but that gives the the fly a nice little sparkle. So you've got that micro flash of boo underneath then the super hair on top so that gives you some some nice little sparkle subtle sparkle not super bright but then that flash of blue especially the uv shines through and i think it really does look a lot like a shrimp the iridescence of a shrimp a lot of shrimp species so i'm going to take the super hair past the hook away it's a little past the eyes about a quarter of an inch past the eyes measure that And then tie it in, make sure I got it straight. It's gotta be perfectly balanced, straight. Now if you want, you can put some, some UV on it. Bonefish don't have teeth. They have soft mouths if you've ever fished for bonefish. So if I'm tying these specifically for a bonefish trip, I won't put the I won't put the uh, like Solarex on it. But if I'm fishing along the Texas coast where redfish and trout, they have teeth and crunchers, I'll go ahead and put Solarex on it so the fly will last longer. Then I'll trim the legs, take them a little out past the eyes. There was some lacquer and that's it, we're done. A sweet and simple little bonefish fly, but very, very effective. So you get that little bit of sparkle, you get a nice shell, that super hair, because it's not straight. You can see that it, I don't know, I just, I like that a lot. The silly legs kind of make it, the head stand up like a, a shrimp, and the eyes are up high. So it very much does look like a little shrimp, like a little mantis shrimp. 
Okay, simple little fly. The super hair is what I think makes it, makes the pattern and makes it very effective. And uh, I tied it with lead. So depending upon lead barbells, so depending upon the sink rate, how deep of water you're going, you can use medium, small, or sometimes I tie it with bead chain, large bead chain or medium sized bead chain too. Okay, so this is the jerk me fly. And it's called a jerk me because it mimics a jerk bait. So if you've fished with conventional tackle fishermen, they have these things called jerk baits. They're plastic and they're weedless. The hook comes up through the belly and just barely pokes out on top. So you can throw these things into the grass, but the way you fish them, it's, you jerk them. And when you do, they go in random patterns in the water. And that really attracts our predator species on the coast, redfish and especially trout. So my goal was to try and build a, uh, a fly that mimics that, something that was real weedless, and that when jerked through the water, it would dance through the water. So the key to this fly, and when this when this hook came out, I was like jumped up and down. It was one of those. It's about time somebody came out with a really good heavy duty bin back fly, or bin back hook. I mean, so here's the hook, and that is just a very very well designed bin back hook. A lot of times on the Texas coast, people will make bend backs, but what they'll do is they'll take a regular hook and they'll, they'll heat it and bend it about right here. But that means that the hook is pointing way up and you don't get very good hookup. It's very weedless, but you don't get good hookups. Well, this bend back hook, the hook is in the exact same direction, going the same direction as this part of the hook. So that means when you set the hook, you're going to get really good hook you know, really good set of the hook. So once this hook came out and I found it, I went, yeah, this is great. I got to make me a fly that I can throw way into the grass and that's going to have the same action as a, a jerk bait. And so I came up with this pattern and you can see it's got bunny on it. I used the UV crystal flash chenille for the gills. It's got a barbell weight on it. I'll talk about that in a second. Then the head is deer hair. And so a lot of action. The first time I took this fly out to try it, it was in a little pond near my house. And I was going to try and catch some little bass. I caught a four-pound catfish, which surprised the heck out of me. That's the biggest catfish I've ever caught on a fly rod. And then I caught that big redfish that was in the Everglades. And I've had several of my buddies uh, in the area start tying this fly and they've been doing real well all on the Texas coast with it. So it'll work any place there's redfish or speckled trout. Oh, snook, I caught seven snook on it when I was in the Everglades. But what it's not good for is baby tarpon. I had probably jumped probably six or seven baby tarpon and did not have a single hookup. I think because the, the shape of the mouth of a tarpon, it's like, well, I can't really show you. Uh, when they bite it, the bin back just doesn't hook them in the upper lip. And so there's not good hookups with tarpon. But everything else I've fished for have been very successful on this fly. All right, we start with the first thing we tie on. Oh, and we're going to be using my deer hair technique called flaring. And I don't know, Al, do you want me to talk about flaring again? We did a session on it already. I think you probably should. You don't need to do a really extensive one, but there's some new people on tonight. Okay, then I'll do a, a quick little flaring deer hair. This is why I came up with this technique. I wanted to be able to get deer hair exactly where I wanted it. So this is an example of the Mohawk minnow sunfish. And you can see using this flaring technique, you can get all sorts of colors, but you can be very specific on where you put them. And then you can vary the amount of hair to get whatever stripe and colorations you want. So real quick, let me get my hook in. I'm gonna use a big hook so I can show this very well is I have 
a weight on my bobbin. I call this my third hand bobbin weight. Let me, let me turn it down a little bit. See that bobbin weight? That's a four ounce lead egg weight that I cut the bottom off of and drilled it out so I can put it over on my bobbin holder. What that does is it keeps constant tension on the thread. So if you've worked with deer hair, you know that it's hollow. And so it, when you, it's like soda straws. If you look at it under a microscope, it's like soda straws that have sponge in them. So when you put your thread on it and pull down, it compresses the straws. And that's what causes the hair to flare up. Now, most people they'll put, if, if you're spinning hair, They'll put the hair on an angle, make five or six wraps, and then pull down, and the hair will spin around the hook. I couldn't do the patterns that I wanted to with that technique or with stacking, which is you get hair on the hook, then you stack on top, uh, and which is great for doing circles, but I wanted to be able to do those stripes like you saw in the, the Mohawk Minnow Sunfish. So this technique, and the reason I have the one camera set up is so that you can see how I use my fingers. So I take three fingers, two underneath the hook, one on top. I'll transfer the hair from my right hand to my left hand and pinch it and hold it in place. Then I'm gonna make one wrap, just one. Then I'm gonna pull down hard and flare the hair, but I'm pinching it between my fingers. Now, if I let go right now, it would start spinning. I don't want it to spin. So I'm gonna leave one finger in place to keep it from spinning use my first finger and my thumb to pull the hair out of the way. And then I'm gonna make three or four anchor wraps. And that way, as you can see from the, the one camera angle, I can put a hair 180 degrees on top, then I'll do the same thing on bottom and I'll get 180 degrees on the bottom. I can alternate colors. And that's how we get the patterns like this. And again, I can vary the amount of hair I put on from like the purple and the chartreuse are very just small amounts, whereas the green and the black are larger amounts and the orange and the yellow are, are larger amounts. And so that you can easily see the difference, I grabbed a hot pink piece of hair. So now I'm gonna do on the bottom. So I'm gonna take my three fingers, pull the hair out of the way, transfer from right to left, pinch it between my fingers, do one wrap, Keep it from spinning, pull the hair back, make four wraps, pack it in. Now, the reason I have the bobbin weight here, this is very important. It took me a long time to figure this out. Because the hair is hollow, if I don't keep constant pressure on it, the hair will expand back out. And then the next time I tie on, I've got some loose hair. Before I figured out this constant weight with this bobbin, third hand bobbin weight, I'd tie flies and then after four or five bass, they'd start falling apart. So keeping constant pressure on to make sure the hair doesn't expand out and, and make the tie loose this is very important. That's really the, one of the keys to this technique. But you can see in one of the camera angles, I now have pink 180 degrees on the bottom and white 180 degrees across the top. Okay, so that's my deer hair flaring technique. But what's Another nice attribute of this technique is it allows you to put hair over the top of stuff. So that's a big benefit. I'm gonna show you that in a second. I'm gonna put deer hair over the rabbit strip or I tie in the rabbit strip. Okay, so to get started, we're gonna get our thread going and do our, our bright red medium chenille, cactus chenille, UV. So I'm going to make just like one, two, maybe three wraps. I'll do two wraps. It's pretty thick. And tie it off. Okay, there's my gills. Next, I'm gonna tie my barbells. Now, with this pattern, you have an option. You can use, this is a medium lead barbell. 
And I'm going to tie it in right at the bend. Um, one of the things you want to be aware of on this pattern is controlling the center of gravity. So looking at it from left to right, the center of gravity of this hook is pretty far back here. So if you measure from the eye all the way to the point and find out where that midpoint is, it's about right here, that's your center of gravity. Now this fly then, if we didn't weight the front of it, when you pull it through the water and then you stop, it would sink back in first. And that's not a motion that I've ever seen a bait fish do. We're mimicking bait fish here. So what I wanna do is put some weight on here so that I move my center of gravity more toward the center. I don't want it all the way up in front for this pattern because to get that motion of it jerking back and forth and, and kind of jerking up a little bit, I want my center of gravity to be about right in here. So I'm gonna put my barbells in just right in front of the, the crystal chenille. But if I wanted this pattern to sink quickly, nose first, then I'd move the barbell up and put it up near the eye and I'd probably go with a heavy barbell. So speckled trout specifically, and it's one uh, species specifically, it likes a jigging motion. It likes going up and down. That's a, a lot of the conventional fishermen, they use coho minnows and, and other soft plastics and they jig them through the water. And it seems to attract the trout. So if you want the jigging, real simple, just put a heavy barbell on it and move it up toward the front. That way it'll sink nose first. When you pull it, it'll go up and it'll go up and down like a jig. But I want mine to be almost neutral buoyant and I want it to jerk. I want it to be, there's a, the jerk baits, they don't sink very fast. A lot of guys don't even put any weights on them. They just fish them with a bare hook and it stays in the middle of the water column where a lot of the, the predator fish are, the redfish and especially the speckled trout are. Okay, so we got my barbell right where I want. So I'm move my center of gravity up a little farther from where it was. Next we get the, where did it go? Let me get a rabbit strip. And I like to use grizzled rabble, rabbit strips. This rabbit strip is mm, one and a half times the length of my hook approximately. All right. So I'm gonna tie the rabbit strip in right on top of the barbell. Make sure I get it in straight. Okay, I'm gonna hit that with a little bit of lacquer to make sure it stays in. Okay, now comes the deer here. Here comes the fun part. So again, this technique of flaring hair allows me to put hair on top of stuff. If you're spinning, you can't do this. Some people would probably say I'm stacking on top of the rabbit strip. So I'm gonna take a pretty good clump, size of clump of hair. Again, do my three fingers. I'm gonna do two wraps to get this first one started. Flare it down, keep it from spinning, and then do my anchor wraps. Done. Now this particular pattern, I, I just use one color. I just use white. I could do, and I've thought about doing this, maybe use a darker green or olive green rabbit strip and do olive hair on top and then white hair on bottom. I don't think it's necessary because this pattern's worked really well with just one color. Okay, now I'm gonna put a clump of hair on the bottom. Same technique, hold it in place, flare it out, pull it back, do my anchor wraps. Now I'm gonna put a clump of hair right on top of the barbell. Pull the hair out of the way. Flare it, get the hair out of the way and then do my anchor wraps. That third hand bobbin weight keeps everything in place just the way I want it.
Next clump goes on the bottom. Next one on top. Let's see, if I'm doing the stripes, then I just have to keep track of the pattern I'm using and alternate the, the hair colors and the amount of hair. Once you get this technique down too, it goes really fast. Okay, I'm gonna get my hair packer and pack it in just a little bit. Okay, I've got room for one more on the bottom and one small one on the top. Like some of the best I've gotten is from the Ohio region or even further north. Because the further north, the colder it is, the more the deer have to insulate and typically the, the larger diameter of the hair. And the best hair, see, I don't have a piece handy. The one that I use a lot, if I want a, a like a, a bass popper to sit way high up and, and stay, because deer hair becomes uh, saturated and will start to sink. If I want a, something to sit way high up and make a big splash and doesn't get saturated for a long time, I use pronghorn antelope. Pronghorn antelope is about three or four times the diameter of deer hair, but it's hard to get hold of. A good piece is hard to get hold of. If you don't tan it right, it becomes brittle. And a lot of times when you pull down on it, especially if you use gel spun or Flymaster Plus, you'll cut the hair, you'll cut the pomegranate antelope. Okay, so I don't have much hook showing, but as long as I can get my thread around the eye of the hook, I can pull this down and get it on the hook. Okay, you wind up with a really nice hairball when you get done. So, ready now to get the whip finish in. That whip finish can be a challenge when you got that much hair that close to the uh, that close to the eye. Let's see if I can get in here and get this whip finish on. So I'm using my thumb to keep it from coming off. All right, now we're ready to trim. When I trim hair, and I use only scissors, my wife doesn't let me have really sharp objects, so she didn't let me have a razor blade. No, that's my joke. I learned how to do this technique with my son sitting in my lap when he was three years old. So razor blades were not allowed. So I learned how to do all the trimming with scissors. The first cut you make is the one that's closest to the hook. I call it my reference cut. So that's going to be the cut on the bottom. Remember, what I'm after is that bullet-shaped head, the one that's going to dance around in the water when I jerk it really fast. I can see by the way you're doing that, Ron, you've never done this before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still a newbie at this, Al. I've been using this technique for many, many years. Uh, this technique was in Fly Tire Magazine in the spring of 1999. So if you're a collector of Fly Tire Magazine, So there's a complete write-up on this technique in that article. Right. Now I gotta trim this hair off and make sure I don't cut my rabbit strip off. Next is we've got to get the rabbit strip over the hook. So we're going to take our, our back and our needle. Now, leather, when it gets wet, it stretches. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure where the hook is because this is we're going to pull the rabbit strip over the hook. We're going to measure where the hook is. Then we're going to go up just a little bit, not a whole lot, just a little bit. And we're going to poke a hole in the rabbit strip. 
And then when we pull it over the hook, it's going to be tight. But that means when it gets wet, it's not going to have any slack in it. All right, now that rabbit strip will tear if you hook a big fish. So I take one of my favorite glues, Softex. I like Softex because when it dries, it doesn't have any taste. And so I'm going to get my Softex. I'm going to have to do it like this and put a drop and Put it right there where the hook goes in and make sure I saturate the leather very thoroughly. And this will make the leather very tough. Now all we have to do is put the eyes on and we're done. So I've already cut the stems off my doll eyes. I love these doll eyes. Now the, so in the recipe you saw soft text and then you also saw Loctite stick and steel outdoor adhesive. This is what I use for my eyes. Now, you, some of you all heard the story. I got so frustrated because my eyes kept falling off. I went to Home Depot and I bought every glue they had about 15, 20 years ago. And this is what won. This is the best I found because it's got some nasty chemicals in it. And it, uh, don't watch this. It has some chemicals that melt the plastic. So by using this, the hair gets melted into the plastic. So I very, very seldomly have my eyes come off now that I've started using this stuff. So what I do is I get a drop of the glue on the end of my bodkin. Then I pick up my eye with the glue. If you get this glue on the front of the eye, you cannot get it off. It melts the plastic immediately. And so you'll get an eye that's got a lot, of, a lot of stuff on it. So by picking up the eye with the glue and using your, your needle to put the eye on, you avoid getting the glue on the front. I just push it on there, make sure they're even. And there you go, there's a jerk me. If you notice the underside is curved a little bit. I like that. So when I pull it, the fly kind of jerks up and it'll jerk to the left and the right and it'll sink a little bit, then it'll jerk up like a little fleeing bait fish. And it really does elicit a lot of big. Okay, done. Any questions? This time we're going to talk about the Macos cameras. You see them all the time. We're going to see uh, the results of one tonight. And what I've done with that is we've added a simple, very inexpensive little ring. You see it right here. Costs less than $10. Takes a really good lens and turn in, turns it into a totally awesome lens. And I'll move over to the camera on the vise right now, just so you can see it a little bit closer. As you can see, it's threads, male end, female end. On Amazon, you'll find that called C. This end is C like Charlie. This end, the female end is called CS, Charlie Sierra. Anyway, C to CS, five millimeter. Uh, a mounting ring. And let's, I'm going to go real quickly back to this area here. And where I got the idea for this is my old Nikon camera and the old lens. I've had this lens since the late 60s. I think I got it in 69. But anyway, it's a, came on my old Nikon F. And along the way, I found that I could turn a regular lens into um, macro lens by adding an extender ring. And all that's all it is, is, an, is a ring. There's, there's no glass in it or anything like that. It's just an extender ring. And it puts more distance between the film or the sensor. That's what I'm trying to say. And you put the 
lens on that, and it turns it into a macro. Mm -hmm. All I got to think, and I wonder if it would be possible to do the same thing with my Macos camera, because the Macos camera is wonderful, but it's got one little problem. I wish it would focus just a little bit closer. Let me show you what I mean. Now, this is as close as I can focus this, and that's why we always demonstrate in a size, oh, eights and tens and sometimes twelves. That right there is a ten. And when I really need to emphasize a point, we've built a digital zoom into our the program, the switching program, and that's just digital, digital zoom. It gives you a good close up, but if you look real close, it's a lot blurrier than this. Well, I added this ring in between the lens and the camera. And I'm going to make some changes here now, and I'm gonna allow you to see just what happens when we're able to zoom in even closer because of the extra distance between the lens and the camera. So let's just go this way. That yeah, should be just about enough. And then let's go this way. Sharp. Is that crystal clear enough for you up close? Now with this, but the and I have not moved the camera at all. It's still the same distance away, so I still have plenty of distance between me and uh, the fly, so that I've got distance to tie without uh, having to be too close. Yet I can zoom in, so I can easily do a size sixteen and still not use up any more screen space than I did back here. the way it originally was. Al, which of your lenses are you using, the 6 to 12 or the 10 to 50? That's the 10 to 50 right there. Okay. And I, and I get a comparable adjustment with the 6 to 12, but um, it, I understand it's a 6 to 12, and it, it's going to be a little different because I think this works almost like a 2X extender does on a regular camera where you, you make a... Um, a macro lens out of a regular lens and it, and it also uh, doubles it. If it's a 50 millimeter regular lens, it becomes a hundred millimeter macro. Uh, at least that's the way my extenders are here. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. For now, it's a wrap though. Until next week, we'll be back. We'll be back then. Thanks for joining us.